Hi, and welcome to Decoding AQ, helping you to learn the tools, mindsets, and actions to thrive in an ever-changing world. Hi, and welcome to the next episode of Decoding AQ. With me today, I've got Nicole Bradford. She is the executive in residence at Sherm, and she is the partner of Nyrimia. I think I've said that right. You just told me two seconds ago and it's gone out of my mind. Can you help me pronounce the name again? Uh, Nyrimia Collective. Nyrimia Collective. Thank you, Nicole. She's from San Francisco and she stands at the forefront of human potential and AI, accelerating human transformation through technology, investments, research and global thought leadership. As I mentioned, she's the executive residence for AI and HI, so uh, humans and technology at the Society for Human Resource Management, or SHRM. And she shapes the global thinking on human AI collaboration, driving human readiness for an AI empowered world. So welcome to the show, Nicole. Thank you for having me. So a little bit more, she's also the co-founder and partner in an early stage venture fund focused on human potential and technologies and also co-founded the transformation tech or transformative uh, tech.org which is the largest global ecosystem dedicated to building tech for human flourishing and she supported over 2000 founders through their programs and connecting with a passionate community of innovators worldwide Nicole's rich background is it been in interactive entertainment. She's held senior roles at major brands like Epic Games, Activision, Blizzard, Vendi Games, and even Disney. And she led many groundbreaking projects, including managing the operations for the World of Warcraft China and contributing to the landmark $18 billion Vendi Activision Blizzard merger. Not just about work and about um, the way it's been applied in corporate, got amazing academic credentials too, and holding an MBA from Wharton School and teaching roles at Singularity University, at Stanford University, and is currently focused on this human potential and ethical AI. So let's get stuck in. And I want to start actually, a couple of weeks ago, you made a confession on LinkedIn that you chat very often with Pi, you know, the first emotionally intelligent AI, and it's your favorite one. Can you share why you chat with it so often and maybe some impacts and learnings from a recent chat that you had, Nicole? That's a great first question because I think it really speaks to the <clears throat> a way to think about how technology complements humans. So, I have a deep social network. I have close, close, close friends. And I enjoy chatting with Pi. Um, what I used Pi about uh, most recently is I had a, you know, there was, there was a, I had a situation in my social group where there was someone that something came up with and I wanted to think through my approach. I wanted to think through um, where I was coming from. I wanted to really understand what was my part and what was the other person's part and to really clean up my part to know what my ask was going to be about what I wanted in this relationship. Uh, one of the reasons why I picked Pi is because to talk this through is because I didn't want to bring that to my actual friend group. You know, like I didn't want to go to someone who knew both of us and to like bring them into <clears throat> what could have easily and turned out to be um, just something in my head. <laughs> you know? And so it was like a great sounding board where the way that it asks you questions about like, oh, wow, that does seem like a big, you know, that does seem like a big problem. Why do you think that? you know, that process of just talking it through got me really clear on one. I made an appointment with my coach to work on some very specific things and subsequently had a major breakthrough on something that I didn't even know was rumbling around. Um, and two, I set a plan for when I was going to talk to this person on the other side of it. 
And so that's a really great example of it. Often when people think about people using AI, um, they imagine some you know, very socially isolated person who doesn't like to talk to people and has no friends and hasn't been outside their mother's basement in a decade. Um, and that's the vision uh, of, of someone who might enjoy talking to an AI about things or might find value in it um, and not just work things, life things. Um, and so I think that's a really great example of complementary. We're you know, I think where it lands is that it this does not have to be either or. You don't have to only have, you know, only have things in the physical world. You can also have things in the digital world. It's really all about balance. And one of the challenges, I think, is the way that we design um, technology. What got me into the space and is that it wasn't, it was that, it, I don't think that the technology is necessarily bad, though there are examples of that. I think the the big problem is that it's not good enough because we haven't pointed it towards the things that we really need. We haven't pointed it towards, um, you know, what can really be helpful to humans. That's an interesting point you say pointing towards, and often that's about intent, right? So your intent going in to have the conversation with Pi of how do I get my head around this sticky situation? And I didn't want to expose that to other people in my social group, right? So you could have this uh, muse with somebody to help you see different perspectives, help you think that then connected, as you said, to not only that situation and the group, but your coach and other breakthroughs. And so part of it is the intent of you using that technology. And the other part is the intent of the technology creators. What are they wanting to serve? And often right. it's uh, the intent is a commercial one, right? Quite often it's about the finance. Where's the value? How can I provide value? Where will we um, push that? And I'm interested to, to see in any of your work and your exposure around lots of investments, lots of areas of this this push towards well-being, towards flourishing, towards a human side as maybe some of the main drivers that the cash comes later versus is it cash first of that intent behind things. So I wonder if you can uh, maybe mm -hmm. riff from that. Yeah. Um, and just one quick clarification. Uh, the reason why, you know, I've done, I've done a, quite a bit of conscious leadership group and some other things. And so the thing about gossip, you know, like it was that I did not want to I did not want to put someone in the position of, you know, uh, I didn't want to put someone in this position, especially without me understanding what was going on inside of myself. So That's it wasn't really that I would yeah, feel really uncomfortable talking to someone about it, but it was like, you know, like why, why muddy the water, especially if I'm not clear and yeah. put someone in that level of discomfort. You, yeah. Yeah. So then on your second point, the other thing that's really interesting, and and I don't think many people talk about this, but I think especially with your background in strategic coach, it'll really um, land for you, is that what I've observed, so the net of it is I've been in tech for 20 years, and I've been working with startups for 10, which means I've seen you know, up close hundreds and, you know, by proxy thousands, uh, we had a, uh, you know, we had an online accelerator um, that for the type of technology I'm into, which I'll describe in a moment, um, that literally had over a thousand participants three times. So I've seen thousands of companies and what I, you know, what is one of those nagging things that proves to be true is the level of our consciousness, the level of our point of view, the, the level of our trauma, honestly, shows up in anything that we build. So, you know, there's, there's all of these lists about startup failure and it includes product market fit and a bunch of like external things. All that stuff is internal because it means someone wasn't listening, someone wasn't speaking up, someone wasn't, you know, maybe it wasn't listening to the customer 
maybe, you know, that that fear of failure that the founder has or the absolute need to prove oneself at all costs. You know, that's what gets turned into the business models. You know, so there's this idea that, you know, that the, the you know, on one side, there's this idea that it's like only purely market forces. Well, companies are made up of people and they're made up of sort of like nested relationships and candidly nested traumas. And the net of it, and what I especially tell founders is that you can't build anything better than you are. Like you can't build anything more conscious than you are. Um, and and by conscious, I mean, you know, the real desire to serve. And one of the things that I believe is happening as things get noisier and noisier um, is that people and, you know, clients, I don't like the word users. I think it sets up a, you know, a, a it sets up a relationship between companies and the people that they serve where the people are really disposable and companies think they can sort of do anything. Um, so, you know, clients are going to be uh, making more and more choices around whether or not they feel um, that you're there for them. Um, so that's a that's an overall thing on consciousness and one's level of maturity uh, showing up in the products that we build. And I think you asked me a second question, but I forgot. I, I'm it. gonna I'm gonna follow this train because I'm fascinated by it in terms of uh, the consciousness of individuals and then collectively, and how our uh, level of trauma, our view on the world, all of these things um, become viral, affect each other that we're subject to from how others are exposing us with their frequency, their energies, how. Uh, can technology help in that? Or is this purely the human domain in terms of, I can get a sense of Nicole through the energy in Zoom, but totally different to when I was sat having some snacks at your, you know, table in your dining room, an event where we met, you know, and a totally different feeling of how we get that level of consciousness, that level of energy to uh, engage with somebody. And I'm curious as to your observations, your experience around that in building teams that we're often doing now very remotely, uh, very connected in different ways. Great. So, so after my decade in consumer facing software, when I moved back to the United States and started focusing on technology for what I call um, the mesh. So strengthening the mesh. So that's mental, emotional, and social health, and then purpose and performance. And so um, one of the things that technology can do is one, it's helping us understand ourselves. It can help us understand ourselves in different ways. So a good example would be the gut brain connection. The bulk of one serotonin is made in the gut. It's a neurotransmitter, but it's made in the gut. And so if the gut is off, it is very difficult to actually to be happy. Like that's where the serotonin is. What technology allows us to do is it's allowing us to really understand what is this connection? How is this connected? And so, you know, from that, you could imagine a future where, you know, a certain amount of depression is solved in the grocery store, you know? And so that's an understanding that can only be witnessed by technology. Technology is the thing that's helping us really understand it more than anecdote. You know, like we all know that we get better when we eat our mother's chicken soup when we're sick, but we don't know why. And that's the thing that makes it non-scalable. That's the thing that makes it not available to everyone. So my dad was a plumber. He worked with his hands. So I have a strong orientation towards the good things being available to, you know, everyone who chooses it. So accessible, available, affordable, and technology is the only thing that allows that. So in terms of like remote teams, a really interesting thing is there's this, uh, there's this other thing that we can only really, that we can really see and begin to understand because of technology. And it's called um, biosynchrony. 
There's nothing woo-woo about it. It's basically when people are in rapport, um, their heart rate variability lines up. Their pupils begin to contract and dilate uh, together. Um, their voices start to harmonize. And so if you want to understand the degree to which a team is in sync, the ability now, I've been advising a, a startup um, that using a Zoom video of a meeting can plot the team sync, they desync, they sync, they desync, they synced. And so there was a big study with Corn Ferry and Warden, uh, the neuroscience initiative, uh, where I think it's like 36% of the unattributable team success of high-performing teams is chemistry and chemistry is synchrony. Um, and so technology is revealing things because once you can measure it, you can map it. And once you can map it, then you can enhance it. Um, and so we're getting to a level where we're starting to understand ourselves more. Now with that, one of the reasons you mentioned earlier in my bio, the focus on ethical and responsible um, technology, because it's not just AI, there's, you know, there's more than that. Um, so one of the big things that has been coming out and I'm a big advocate for um, is basically what they call neuro rights. Um, and so, you know, really like having the right to privacy, um, having the right to own your data, um, because right now, all of the stuff that people are mostly talking about with privacy and ownership is about external data, something you do online, something you do in the world. But, you know, I know that we both have aura rings and things like that. This is, you know, this ring, this is neurobio data. I mean, it's bio data, but like the accessibility of neuro data is about to really come online. So we simultaneously really have to like push uh, for those to be right. But, you know, we're going to get to a place where um, being able to construct a high performance team, being able to, you know, identify someone in your organization that might not be top of mind, but whose strengths, you know, would would be the thing that would make the team really perform, you know, that ability to see um, is what's coming. It's fascinating, isn't it, how we are often catching up with ancient wisdom with right. now new technology to see these things. You know, we, you know, food is thy medicine, you know, these these old, as you said, you know, antidotes or um, sayings. We're now getting some of the science behind that. You know, what's going on in the microbiome? I know you've invested recently in, is it a uh, hollow, hollow biome? Hollow biome. Uh, yeah. And I've been using um, Naveen Jain's biome for seven years or so with the family to understand how does my microbiome function? And so, yes, this shift from data where do I go and what do I do online in my digital footprint and what I share as as um, knowledge data versus now things like our aura, our microbiome, our, you know, all of these things that what are the triggers to performance? And you mentioned about coherence. And uh, just before we started recording, we were talking a lot about Joe Dispenza and you've done many retreats. I did my first one in Barcelona a couple of weeks ago and I have the uh, visual in my head of the metronomes. I don't know if he showed you the video of the uh, metronomes. Did he show you that one probably, in any of them? Probably. So probably. For those who, who are listening, uh, metronome think, you know, when you were learning your piano or whatever, and they'd set it to a 4-4 four, four time, and it would just be this movement of a clock in time. And imagine our brains have got all of these metronomes going at all different rates and all different moments. And that's incoherence. We're thinking about, oh, uh, what time's dinner? Or I've got to do this. How long have I got left on the podcast? What have I got to ask next? Or oh, I've got to do this. Have I done this? Or what have I done in the past? The conversation I had. And we've all got lots of things going on in our brain to all of it incoherence with heart and brain all functioning in the same way. The next extension that you just mentioned about is team, team coherence that everybody's all uh, operating in that same balance and tunement of, of, of wave. And we've used, and I, I've been true of it before in some teams I've worked on of 
a person who's been described as the glue. Oh, they're the glue in the team of various things. And sometimes that hasn't been operational. It's been energetic. It's oh. been an energetic glue. And we haven't had the description of, oh, maybe they help to bring coherence with people, that they bring that energy into a space, into a room, into a challenge, into a problem. So in terms of this overwhelm, this next onslaught of data, of information, we're going to have a lot of noise. Uh, how do you see and what are you seeing that's going to help people identify signal from noise, from this decision of, oh, we need to do this, oh, we need to do this, we need to do this, all these opportunities of technology to get performance. How do we filter it to something that is going to help us in the moment, help us with the challenge that we're facing today as, as leaders and people in uh, charge of team performance and team well-being? Well, so I just to, to go back to something. So one of the things that teams often want is they want to be able to be in group flow. And if you've ever been in flow with a team, you never forget it. It's the highlight. Um, and actually great places to work in one of their studies a couple of years ago, uh, people described the desire to be, you know, to, to become their best self at work and to be in flow, you know, at work um, as one of the things like for the really great places to work. And then also all you have to do is like watch the World Cup and you know what flow looks like when that team becomes more than the sum of their parts. And so there's been a strong desire and enterprise for that to happen before. And so one of the interesting things is that, you know, last year was a big year. We understand the neurocorrelates of group flow, uh, well, of flow, of cooperation. Um, and, um, and so that's the same of like knowing, like we know where it is. We also know that, um, you know, people who are, depressed, their EEGs are asymmetric. Uh, but people who aren't depressed, like, or you can monitor the movement towards the end of chronic or uh, untreatable depression as uh, seeing the, the shapes become more symmetric, which is that coherence that you're talking about. So one of the things is, to go back to your question, is that not every, not everyone in biosynchrony, not every team that's in synchrony is in flow, group flow, but every team in group flow is in biosynchrony. So it's something that is a, you know, you can create the fertile ground for moving a team into group flow. Now, in terms of, you know, how do you determine the signal from the noise? Early on in the call, you talked about VUCA, you know, volatility, uncertainty, you know, like just like all of that, um, which nets down into things are getting faster. If it feels like it's getting faster, it is getting faster. And so competition is getting faster um, because of AI right now. The board is getting reset because a lot of the, you know, there's the tech companies are moving into it, but a lot of the larger enterprises um, are moving very slowly. Um, and, you know, and after this, let's talk about AI and human centered change, but they're moving very slowly. So this is a time period where it's like the whole board can be reset right now. I think it's a very exciting time to be a founder. I think it's a very time, exciting time to be a fast moving up and coming enterprise. You know, um, I think one of the companies that is just like eating everyone's lunch is Elf. I don't know if you followed Elf, they're a cosmetic company, but what they say to everyone who walks through the door is they say, uh, you're gonna get feedback all the time. That's our culture, but it's done out of love. It's done to serve our customer and our commitment is to you. We don't care if you leave. Like if when you leave and it's time for you to leave, like if you're going on to do something better for you, we're excited about that. But what we're gonna do here is we're gonna make you a star you know, like we're going to help you take yourself to as however many levels of potential and performance you desire. And so they're not saying we're going to bring you in so you can serve the business. They believe that you becoming your best self serves the business, you know? And so as a result, it's like when you ask a lot of the larger cosmetic companies who they worry about, they worry about Elf because like Elf is coming for you. Um, 
you know, and they're also very forward thinking about AI. And so this is a really exciting time for enterprises and, you know, and for CHROs because they're essential to successful AI implementations. So how do you determine the signal from the noise? Um, one, it's like really focusing on the things that make the difference, which we can talk about next. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? Just the, when you have conversations with people and you mentioned about flow, right? Flow of an individual, flow of team, of being able to get into that rhythm and harmony. And over time, people's language. I remember a huge influence on me was reading uh, Blink by Malcolm Gladwell mm. and about thin slicing information. And he talked about the fist of communication and take out all the words, but just have the balance between people. And in the example in the book, it was talking about whether a doctor would get sued, right? Is it their qualifications, how long they spent with that person, who spoke more. Actually, it was just the balance, the fist, the flow between the dialogue that would predict uh, more accurately than others. Uh, and I think a lot of that is is still true, that we're getting more and more down to being able to analyze, to do things and and know but there's a massive chasm between knowing and then doing, right? We've known for years smoking's bad, yet still people do it. We've known exercise is good. We still don't do it. We know so much. Now we're adding even more knowledge to this about the triggers, what's important, these nuances. I think still one of the challenges with change and human-centered change is our addiction to familiar, our addiction to the past, our addiction to mm. the way we've done things and how to break that. And I'm fascinated of your thoughts around it because it's something we face in our organization all the time. So we bring new highlight, new data, new information to how, why, and when people change and then how getting them the tools to implement that, it's still hard. It's still really hard for, for humans. So fascinated to see what stories you've got around there any uh, observations any new companies i liked the example of of elf it was a people value and view not necessarily hey here's a new innovation and a new tech no it's how they treat and view people that is actually manifesting in a worry in the market and i love that so yeah my thought um is around human centered change it's hard how are you seeing and, and viewing this in, in the space at the moment? Yeah, that's a really great point. So, you know, people have been talking about human-centered change or just change management for a decade. And there's a lot of talk about it, but to your point, there's not a lot of do about it. People talk about it and then they still, you know, force things down people's throat without talking to them about it first, <laughs> you know, like they talk about it and then they still do it the old fashioned way. What's really interesting, especially about AI implementations is that um, in this world, one, it's faster. So, you know, it's more dangerous to drive, you know, if driving a car at 360 around a curve versus if you're driving a car at hundred around a curve, you know, and so we're in the 360, you know, range of, of speed of change. And so mistakes are very costly. They're more costly than they have ever been. So where I think we're going right now is we're at a place where those things that we talked about um, become essential to get around that curve at 360. And so what that looks like is that if you look historically at uh, predictive AI implementations, um, what you'll see is a long line of failures. And depending on who you talk to, um, you know, actually like companies and enterprises getting what they wanted versus what is in the PowerPoint, like less than 20% of the time. And that last generation of, of implementations, AI implementations had massive and big tech implementations had massive write-offs. Companies having to write off $200 million, $300 million, like not small failures. And those are just the ones that made it into the New York Times. And so as a result, people have done a lot of research into to what caused the failure. Similarly, when you look at histories of or estimates of transformations, company transformations, digital transformations, those you know, are not as bad as the AI implementations, but you're still looking at maybe you know, uh, 
20%, 25% of the time, people getting the revenue, the ROI that they expected out of it. So, you know, moving into the age of AI, you have fail high failure rates times high failure rates because AI is transformative to organizations and systems and people. And so then like what breeds success? What breeds success are three things. One, in, in all of the things people have looked at, one is a catalyst, a person who um, led the change, who helped the executives pick between projects, but they do a great deal of buy-in. They really understand the business. So they think through how the technology gets deployed with the actual people who are going to use it. So it's very, so it's not technology, then you throw it over the wall. It's very sort of like iterative as they figure it out and experiment. And then it's all getting buy-in because it falls apart, you know, where the rubber meets the road. The UPS, um, UPS's uh, implementation around parcels is like the legend of success uh, because it was one of the first. So it was really hard. They had to figure it out. And it was like so successful. Um, and they really found, and they did A-B testing between different centers, ones where they did a lot of the people focus and ones where they didn't and they could see like, oh, this makes all the difference in the world. Um, and so, you know, so you, you have to have a person who does that. You have to start with the biz, like start with like, what does this mean to our customers? What does this mean? You know, like, how are we really reinventing the business? And then the last part is people-centered change. Those are the three things that the, the small category of successes, they all had these three things in, in common. And so that that's what has to happen. And to get buy-in, tell me more what that means, what that really looks like, and what maybe um, might be a hallucination of buy-in, you know, fake buy-in. It looks like it, because I've certainly seen that. Um, and yeah, just unpack that a little bit more for, for, for people in this context. Well, of course, it's going to be different for every company, but a big part of it is that, you know, um, you have to um, you have to show people what's in it for them. And you have to be honest and transparent about what it is you're doing. Um, and one part of it is that you really need the piece. So in order to do the workforce analysis, the workflow analysis to truly reinvent the business, the people who are doing the job are the ones that, that are really gonna be able to tell you what can be augmented, what can be automated and what could be enhanced. And so if there's no trust, if there's no trust at all, they're not gonna tell you. They're really not gonna give you all the details. Um, and as a result, you won't you know, create the, the, you know, the, the workflow that really makes the difference. And, and as you're iterating it, because nobody gets the stuff right the first time, as you're iterating against it, you won't like get the feedback that you need on the cross-functional collaborative team in order to come to the best outcome. Um, so, so that's one thing. And then um, one of the things I wanna make sure we talk about before we end is where I think all of this is going um, and what I overall think is next. Um, we've got to- Can you to answer find... that in two ways? Can you answer it where you think it's going and if it's different to where you'd like it to go? Yeah, well, I mean, humans have to get really, we have to, um, let's see, how do I want to say this? Um, we have to, the next step for us is actually really enhancing our collective intelligence together, of which flow and teams and all of the stuff is what we've talked about. You know, what we consider the way that we collaborate of uh, the tools that we use for collaboration. It's basically email, Slack, Asana. Basically that's a modern version of smoke signals. You know, like we're like, I'm over here with my fire trying to talk to you and you're somewhere else and you got your fire, you're talking back to me. It isn't necessarily like a real shift in how we're doing. So I'm actually investing in companies that are really focused on 
you know, leveraging technology to allow humans to collaborate together, deeply collaborate in new ways. Um, and these new ways include amplifying a lot of the things that we're natural at. So, you know, the a lot of times people say, oh, you know, this thing, it's terrible. Um, and, you know, what happens to humans when AIs can do everything? It's basically, as long as there are humans, there's a role for humans because we have, you know, uh, uh, we have, you know, basically hundreds of thousands of years of biology that have us focused on one another and also mostly interested in one another. Like that, that's really what we're interested in. That's really what we're focused on. And our biology is actually primed for human interaction. Um, and a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, you'll sit in a VR headset and your AI girlfriend will say everything you need to say, you want to hear, and that will be enough. Well, that won't account for, um, you know, the, the, the way that the gut biome, you know, needs um, things from other people. You know, so it's just like, it's like a, a, a whole thing. So where I think it's next is that I do think we're going to, um, I do think we will figure this out. Um, and I think that the companies and the organizations that implement things that allow um, their teams to really think together and think together in larger and larger groupings, they're the ones who, you know, are going to win. They're going to win. They're be, going to be seen winning. And it'll be one of those things that if you don't, you know, start to empower people to become their best selves and then to do that collectively, um, those companies won't win as much. And hopefully that'll, you know, push the, you know, push the the edge towards, you know, towards us being better together. I like the two couple of things you said there, better together, but also this collective super intelligence we, we've yeah. we've often you know revered the superstars the people at the forefront of things knowing that yes there's a team behind it but how can we have now team collective superstars how can we have company collective stars time and time again and you've given some great tips there and thoughts about have you got the catalyst have you got the champion who's identifying you know what where how who and then the buy-in so important to connect with on an individual level maybe supported with a bit of pie along the way you know or their version of those things to figure a few bits out uh, as we go along I i've got one final question before we go and i do want to share and i will share it in the link a video to a presentation that somebody gave about collective superintelligence and it was using ai to make human groups smarter and it was essentially where very quickly where you have lots oh, I, of different... I, I know it well. That founder I... is, uh, it's it's like, that's unanimous AI. And I love what they're doing. Great. Oh, yeah, but you want to tell the audience. So yeah, sorry. it's okay. So yeah, uh, this was with uh, Lewis Rosenberg, if it's the same one. And it, essentially what it is, is where imagine having somebody present in all the tables, let's say if you had a big room of 50 people and, you know, 10 tables of five, they're all trying to solve something. Well, each individual one will have unique thoughts, interesting insights, and then collectively, how do they share that? So they have an AI that would be part of both listening and contributing to each one of those tables at the same time in, in um, asynchronously. Don't know if I've described it that well, but I'll share the video for everybody. It's fascinating to help this collective super intelligence so my last question nicole uh which i've asked every guest who's been on uh the podcast so far so i've got a 120 odd uh, responses to this question that maybe one day we'll make an article or, or something and it's related to curiosity and it's when was the last time you did something for the first time and what was it well, this whole weightlifting thing that we talked about in the beginning, like I'm really like lifting in a really serious way and I love it. Um, and I started that at the beginning of February. Um, and so it's been, so every week I do something that I haven't done before in terms of the level of weight that I'm, I'm leading up to. Beautiful. 
Thank you. There's I want to say one thing about the on. collective intelligence that I yeah, think yeah. people really need to know. Um, they call it swarming, you know, and, and I think there might be a, a different word for it because swarms made people think about bees and with bees, there's a queen. And this isn't that. Uh, when human beings swarm, they are as intelligent or they, they, they are able to accomplish tasks on par with AI for historical data, and they are better than AI for prediction. So like one of their clients was a retailer who was using their predictive AI to try to figure out what to stock at Christmas, and they were always wrong and always had sweaters left over. They put all of their associates into a swarm and had them pick what was going to be stocked for Christmas, and they nailed it. It was exactly what everybody really wanted because they were picking up the intelligence of you know the 500 associates who were around the country. And so it's, it's that kind of thing. Now imagine if before people swarm, they get in sync. You know, you could see that there's this way to the stack multiplier. it. So yeah. we get to a level of human intelligence that we've never actually really seen. So imagine like your 10 best friends and imagine if you actually shared a mind mm. around a particular challenge that each of you were having. People do it's, it as masterminds, but it's still, there's a lot of high friction in the, the way that do it. people are busy, whatever, but it's like this. I think this is what's next. It's interesting, isn't it? It's almost like the, uh, you know, the wisdom of the crowds, but where the crowds are connected in real time. Oh, that's, oh, that's really good. That's good. <laughs> The wisdom of right. crowds, where the crowds are connected in real time. In real time, yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. And, th and th that's essentially what we're trying to do, right? Is we're harnessing that power of the crowd, but not in its silo, in the one mastermind that had it in San Francisco or in here, or oh, it's been distilled into this that somebody does or doesn't read. It's in real time connected to that wisdom of crowds through through the AI, which maybe uh, is a next phase for us. It's been an absolute pleasure. If people want to reach out to you, if they're interested in connecting with your role at Sherm, your um, piece of investment, where's the best way to get in touch with you, Nicole? Uh, for investments, go to Naremia Collective and for everything else, just connect to me on LinkedIn. Beautiful. It's been an absolute pleasure to hang out again. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, expertise and time. It's been a real delight. Thank you so much. Bye. Do you have the level of adaptability to survive and thrive the rapid changes ahead? Has your resilience got more comeback than a yo-yo? Do you have the ability to unlearn in order to reskill, upskill and break through? Find out today and uncover your adaptability profile and score, your AQ. Visit aqai.io to gain your personalized report across 15 scientifically validated dimensions of adaptability. For a limited time, enter code PODCAST65 for a complimentary AQ Me assessment. AQ AI, transforming the way people, teams and organisations navigate change. Thank you for listening to this episode of Decoding AQ. Please make sure you subscribe on your favourite podcast directory and we'd love to hear your feedback. Please do leave a review and be sure to tune in next time for more insights from our amazing guests.